This is the Artist Spotlight series for the revolution will occur after nap time, and I am speaking with Jason Pizzolato, I'm pronouncing uh, it correctly this hey. time, who is the man behind the kind of filthy industrial dub project <laughs> Mind of God. So, uh, Jason, uh, first of all, how are you doing? Oh, doing good, man. Doing good. Uh, took a bit of a hit yesterday. I got some bad news. But, um, speaking of which, I wanted to mention this to you anyway, because I'm thinking about dedicating the, the cassette to my friend who passed away yesterday. If you could add that on there, it would be great, man. Joey Lacaz. He was the drummer for I Hate God. Okay. He yeah. passed away yesterday, man. Yeah. And uh, it's been a rough couple days, man. A lot of people down here tripping out on that. And he, he was. A lot of people don't know this, but... Um, if you look on my page, read you can see it. I posted something that he that he did of a, a show that where he performed. He had also had a, a, a besides just being a drummer, he was a experimental electronic musician. He had a project called Solemn Sickness Continuum. It was sort of like uh, early SPK throbbing gristle type stuff. He used all these old electronic gadgets and they have vis like weird visuals in the background and whatnot. So. Um, yeah, man, I posted that earlier because I don't think a lot of people know about it. People are tripping out on it. They're like, damn, man, I didn't realize he did that kind of stuff too, you know? Yeah, I saw your post about that. Sorry to hear that you lost a friend. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. it it's it's a rough one, man. He was a <laughs> one of a kind, a, a total hilarious guy to be around and just real down to earth, not a, not a snooty snobby guy like some of the, you know, some musicians are like that. Yeah. Not him, not in the least bit, man. Yeah, I can imagine no. anyone in Mind of God is certainly an interesting character. Or, sorry, I have God. I hate God. Wow, mm -hmm. I always screw that up. Yeah. <laughs> I hate yeah. God. Is <laughs> no, it, uh, is it? Oh, yeah, they're a bunch of, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> they're quite the bunch. I, tra I traveled with them a few times. I went to Tennessee with them um, around 03. There was a big fest up there. With um, they headlined it. I went up there with Thorn Green and I had God and, uh, and Ben Falgu's band. We went up to Tennessee. A whole bunch of bands played heavy bands. Meet Jack, Keel Hall, uh, the fucking Champs. It's one of my favorite bands. They're awesome. So um, it's, uh, instrumental technical stuff. Yeah. Did you go up uh, with your band or did you just go up as? No, a no. It was just just like as a friend riding with them. I, at that time, uh, I don't think Apostasy was together anymore. At that time. Um, I used to go to Soul and Green practice like every night with Tommy Buckley, my friend who plays drums with Soul and Green. Okay. He's in he's in Crowbar now. But um I didn't know Crowbar yeah, was I used still to go around. To practice with him all the time. They were like, Man, Jason, we're going to Tennessee uh like tomorrow. You wanna go? I was like, Yeah, dude, fucking right, I'll go. <laughs> so yeah, that's kinda how that happened. So you mentioned uh, apostasy, you so uh do, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, that was the death metal band I was in in the early 90s. Uh, we were influenced by acts such as Autopsy, Immolation, Incantation, Early Napalm Death, that kind of stuff. Um, we used to gig with, uh, we'd play gigs with Thorn Green, Paralysis, Mule Skinner, Flesh Parade, all the other um, heavy acts from down here we used to uh, play shows with. And that lasted a good little number of years. We made a demo and whatnot. And, uh, well, we're right up there with the other recognized bands at that time. And uh, you were just playing in the sort of uh, New Orleans metal scene? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. It was a New Orleans underground heavy scene. Yep, correct. Thrash bands, death metal bands. Um, I Hate God was just starting around that time. Uh, Slugs, who later became Crowbar, we had Incubus, Exhorter. We had a lot of heavy uh, acts uh, who came from this area, for sure. And... Um... Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned this before in the first take, but um, I'll pretend to be ignorant again. Um, now, you know, me up here in Alaska, who doesn't really know anything. <laughs> uh, um, hey, hey you, you picking up faster than most, I'll tell you that. Yeah, but, um, uh, you know, when I think, like, you know, Louisiana rural or just the southern metal scene, I'm usually mm -hmm. thinking of, like, slow, doomy sludge music. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of surprised to hear about death metal in Louisiana. So would you like to talk about yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have the, we have the, all those flavors, man. Uh, we got the, the uh, a lot of the thrash and death metal. We had Exhorter and uh, Graveyard Rodeo, which was um, really the, the first. A lot of people think that I, God, were the first sludgy doom band from down here. 
but actually it was Graveyard Rodeo, who drew their influence from like uh, early Melvins, which is also where I got, got their, a lot of their influence from. When they first became a band, they were like, we just want to be like early Melvins, like Bully Porch Treatments type shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we had in the Slugs, we had them. That was also in that same kind of genre. They later became Crowbar. And there was Shell Shock, and um, then they had the faster stuff like Incubus, the real Incubus, not the not the cheesy Incubus, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the death metal band Incubus. And um, How, did they, they order? Did they spell that like the cheesy Incubus, or did they? Yeah, it's spelled the same. Uh, yeah. I was at least and, hoping uh, that. Um, oh, the other one came out later. That's why I said yeah. we got the real one, and the other one's not real. <laughs> I was I was hoping that they would at least be all metal and use a K or something. <laughs> Yeah, this is about 87 or 88 that they were around. They were the fastest band around here. One of the fastest bands anywhere, really, for the time. So, um, uh, uh, what was your setup and in Apostasy? Was Soil Green. Soil Green is another one. A good friend of mine, Soil Green. Um, there was Mule Skinner, Sweat Parade. Those bands all made albums and whatnot. A lot of people are probably familiar with them. Yeah, because I guess the only, con- you know, you know, me completely removed from it. The only concept of death metal I had was just the stuff you hear coming out of Florida. Mm, yeah, you're right, right. Yeah, they had a lot of a lot of good acts came out of Florida. They all recorded at that same studio, though, Moore Sound Studio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of them kind of had that same kind of polished sound at that time. But they they had some gems come out of that. Though. So, um, if you would please, could you? Uh, what was your setup like in Apostasy? Did you was it just guitar, bass, drums, or did you have multiple guitars? And, and were you playing? Uh, we had two guitars. Okay. I was the rhythm guitar. I wrote the majority of the music, and then there, we had a lead guitarist, Matt Richard. So did he, he just those. he just wieldy wieldy played a bunch of solos, and that was about it. Yeah, he played. Now he he played uh, along with me the rhythm too, but I, I wrote most of it. He wrote some riffs on in two songs. But he uh, and he he'd have a solo or two in a couple of the songs. He's an excellent uh, lead guitarist. And we had drummer Matt Brown. This is his name. He has a new band now called Bad Grass. It's more of like a rock and roll blues kind of band he's doing now. And uh, we had a bass player named Will Langford. But uh, by the time we recorded our demo, he was out of the band. So Matt Richard, the lead guitarist, did the bass track on it. And a uh, vocalist name was Jeremy Grannon. Yeah, it was the original lineup. But we, we went through a couple of other lineups where we had an, a different, uh, a different second guitarist and uh, and a different vocalist and whatnot. But the lineup I just told you is really the classic and actual apostasy lineup. The others are just what wasn't really the same. And we never played shows with the other version either. Okay. As the real apostasy, we played about. Uh, probably about 20 shows total, I guess, with those bands I mentioned before. Jeez, that's, that's a hell of a lot more shows than I've played, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, the first time I was like, oh, oh what, the, what the hell is this? What the? <laughs> kind of nervous, you know, which is natural. Yeah. But after a while, you just you go up there like you're practicing, you know, just go up there like you're at band practice and play, you know. Oh, one of the shows we played, is a story for you. We played with a band. I don't know if you ever saw this before, Reed, but I got I got to make a separate a separate folder for it on my Facebook page. I'm so unorganized about shit. It's terrible. If all the way down on my photos on my page, I got all the flyers up of the apostasy shows that we played with Thorn Green and all, the, all those other bands. We played a show with a band called The Satanic, which was Kirk Weinstein of Crowbar on guitar. Um, Mark Schultz, who, who used to be a bass player for I Hate God on bass. Um, Joe Fazio, who was the drummer for Super Joint Ritual and Hank the Third on vocals. And Phil Ansamo, Pantera Down on drums. Wow. Yeah, that was the last show we ever played at this little place called the Abstract Bookstore. We used to play there a lot. It was a little bookstore. It was it was man, this is a creepy little place, man. <laughs> it was a bookstore, and in the back they had like a big, uh, I guess you'd call it like a garage, like a like a long garage you could walk in and walk down with a solid concrete floor, just like really basic, bare bones kind of place with, with a little stage where you could just set up and play and have like you know 100, 200 people stuff in there, you know. That's really cool. We used to have this. And place, on top uh... of it, on on top of the place was like a some kind of mental institution. Um, wait, and, and uh, we, can you say that again? A mental institution? <laughs> yeah, and we'd be playing shows, 
and uh, and sometimes the the yeah, it was like like a mental outpatient place. <laughs> and sometimes it, they would come down there for the shows. It was crazy, man. Literally. <laughs> Did you ever were there like crazy mosh pits or something? Just because uh, they're it was nutters in the... we had we had this one vocalist named Troy, who was after Jeremy, and he was big time into Gore. Remember Gore, the, the band that would spray you with blood and all that kind of stuff. Everyone shit? knows Gore. <laughs> okay, well he would like that a lot, and so I kind of let him run with that, and and he would like get like buckets of like cow blood and stuff and I don't know where the hell he got this shit man like dead birds with maggots in them and shit and he'd throw it out in the crowd <laughs> and he took the head of a, a raw steak some kind of big old slab of meat and he threw it out into the crowd and one of the mental guys the mentally you know the handicapped type people from upstairs was down there and he picked it up and was gnawing on it and was running around in a circle in the pit gnawing on the raw meat <laughs> <laughs> That is, that I'm is crazy. trying to play, looking at this guy, thinking to myself, man, I hope we ain't liable or something happens to this dude. You know, I'm not, no, I'm not. I didn't throw it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, I could tell you a million stories about that place. But anyway, that the last show we played was with that band, The Satanic. So at least we went out with a with a bang. They, they never, um, The Satanic never released any any uh, albums. They did record a demo, which I have a copy of on tape. I don't think only a handful of people have ever heard it. It was, it was they dress up in costumes like and they, and they had names like the dark lord of all were goats was i think phil's <laughs> name and it so yeah it, it, it was kind of like a like a play on black metal black metal was just coming out there was dark throne and a handful of others yeah that that it's sounds the like they uh, that, that i was just about to say that sounds like a black metal gimmick if i ever heard right one. yeah that's what they were doing they, yeah it was, it was kind of like making fun of black metal but at the same time some of the the rips and such were good it was it was heavy stuff, man. It was satanic. Yep, that was the last show we ever played. It was it was with them. You know that's kind of funny because um, that reminds me of like sometimes the joke bands are better than the real thing. Because I'm thinking, of, <laughs> what was yeah. that? A uh, you know, Cannabis Corpse. You ever heard of that? Yeah, right. Yeah, I and heard two songs by them. I was like, damn, these dudes are more talented and better than Cannibal Corpse. I, I know their riffs are insane for people that smoke I, I, pot all the time. He said that because I ran a, so I don't know who posted it or where it was, but I saw it on Facebook or something. Somebody posted that shit, and some I think I clipped on it on accident or something. If I wouldn't have normally probably went to listen to that, honestly, and I, at the time I was like, "Whoa, these dudes are shredding and shit." <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you were in this death metal band until when, when did you guys break up? Hmm. I guess about. Let me think for a minute. Uh, around ninety-eight ish. Okay, and uh, yeah, about ninety-eight. And um, and you started this Mind of God in um, February of this year, right? Yep, February of this year I started uh, it. Okay, so that's you know. Over... I can tell you about. Let me tell you about how I started that. Well, again. yeah, I was just about to. You know that you. So you basically took just over ten years off, and then you come. Yeah, I did. I did. Then you I come had back a lot of with personal a, uh... problems where I wasn't. Music wasn't even on my mind at the time. I was just going through a lot of hard stuff. The hurricane came and made it worse, and so uh, eventually. Uh, about two years ago, I stopped doing all the stupid shit that I was doing, and I, I got my mind right, and uh, and I got another guitar and uh, equipment, and I wrote about 13 new songs. It's not total. It's not really some of the riffs you could consider death metal, but it's more influenced by like uh, stuff like early Melvins and uh, Confessor and Breadwinner, like heavy off time kind of, kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so I've got a bunch of new songs written in that vein. Some of them are on my Facebook page and me playing them, like four, I think three or four of them. I'm going to do another one soon. But anyway, it's really hard to get a drummer and bass player and whatnot because it's, it takes serious dedication and time to do that. And a lot of friends I know are either already in bands or they got families and whatnot. So, and I know what a headache it is being in a band, too. I, I'd still do it, but it's just, it hasn't come together yet. So, um, February of this year. I was screwing around on YouTube listening to noise because I like some noise like Atrax Morgue, uh, death industrial kind of noise stuff too, like Atrax Morgue and Cadaver. Yeah. Brother Death Now, that kind of stuff. And I ran across Noise Nazi and I liked it. So I was like, man, let me, let me see if I can find this page on Facebook. So I found it and I commented under, under one of the tracks. I was like, man, this stuff is killer, man. I was like, I turned my friend Mike Williams from I Hate God onto it. He likes it. 
And so the guy responded. He was like, what? They got, that's my eight guys listening to all stuff. That rules. <laughs> and shit. So then he sent me a friend request on his personal page and it ended up being Matt Bonk, the noise Nazi man. Yeah. So I got to talking to him a bit and uh, we hit it off right from the jump. And uh, I told him my story about how I made music and I showed him some of my songs I wrote on guitar. And I told him that I also liked electronic stuff too not just the death industrial and noise stuff but also like dub like scorn and coil and ambush and solaris and and um tactile and scientist and japanese stuff too like dissecting table and ground zero and shit like that and he was like man he's like you can make some stuff like that look up this program and he told me to look up fruity loops he's like that's what i use to make my stuff i was like all right so i looked it up and I downloaded it, and I started messing with it, and by the very next day, I had the track recorded already. It was a basic track, but I still kind of like it. <laughs> it. The recording quality isn't quite as good as on my newest stuff because I hadn't, all, I hadn't figured out exactly what to do about that yet, but I immediately realized, I was like, man, this is something I can do, and I, I can really, I think, be good at. So uh, I've been at it ever since then, since February, and I've, I've got 26 tracks recorded. A mini LP out on SP, which you put together. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, I got the new cassette coming out. Not coming out, it's called. It's got eight tracks on it. I was going to tell you, too, if if you eventually ever want to make a disc out of that, we can do that, too, if you want to. Yeah, and... Um... I'm a. I, 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 I've, I'm, been, I've well, been like foaming at the yeah. mouth to make a cassette for some reason. <laughs> like old school stuff, you know. It's just like I made a disc. Let me make a cassette too. But those things are cool. Like, man, if your boy wants to make a disc too, that's cool with me, you know. Yeah, or um, we can talk about a digital version or something. Okay. For when the. Cassette but anyway, yeah, that, that's coming out next. Not coming out. It's coming out next. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny because we're talking about this thing that's coming out and it's called not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has like 80 million meanings. I'm yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, I don't know if you noticed it, but on the cover, did yeah. you see that I put not coming out at the bottom, but it's like it looks like it's like a stain on, on the bed, like it's a stain that's not coming out. Yeah, well, and then it shows, <laughs> and then it shows a person like in a mental institution. That too, yeah. It's in, like that person, uh, in a straitjacket. Like that, that person ain't coming out. <laughs> yeah, there, there's so many different ways you can take that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, so I'll talk to you about visuals in a bit, but first I wanted to, I really wanted to explore this kind of jump from death metal to dub because a lot of people uh, might just see that kind of as kind of out of nowhere. But so, um, mm, right, yeah, I can understand that. Um, well, a lot of people they haven't listened to probably a lot of the uh, the the old original dub that is actually heavy and 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 chilled out and it, it's so many different things you can do with it other than like what people normally think of. A lot of people think of oh, it's made electronically and it's called it must be some kind of dance music, you know. But if you go back and listen to to some of the heavier stuff like the groups I mentioned. Well, the artists I mentioned, like Scorn and, and Tactile and Scientist and Coil and Solaris and such, it, it can be just as heavy, if not heavier, than anything with a distorted guitar on it, you know? Yeah. It's just a lot of people don't realize that. But, um, around the late 80s, early 90s, right when the death metal was coming out and whatnot, um, I started getting turned on to by friends and whatnot, um, experimental stuff like those groups I just mentioned, and I've always liked that just as much as I've liked any any guitar driven stuff just as much, if not more. So, um, yeah, I've always wanted to do something like that, and now I have the ability to do it. It's funny you mentioned the heaviness because um, you know when I when I first released your album, it was on SP Net, which is a net thing, so I was only listening to it through my kind of crappy laptop speakers. Uh, right. And then, but when I did that pay for print physical version and I, and I was listening to it to make sure the CD burned okay and mm-hmm. I put it on my real stereo stack, there was yeah. this whole new rich bass that I had completely yeah. missed before. Oh, nice. Those Good. tracks yeah, filled out. Through, man. Some, I got, sometimes I got to tweak things just right to get it either, uh, either, uh, sometimes I'll record a track and it'll be a little too much. So I have to go back and re-record it and pull some stuff back to get it where it's just right, you know? So sometimes a little too much can be good too, though. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just remember suddenly, you know, I could hear the bass going through the floor, and I was like, whoa. 
Yeah. I, yeah, I completely got... missed that. I should have been listening to this on the good speakers the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some, um, I have clip speakers hooked up on my computer, which is what I use these days to listen to my stuff and to listen to music in general. It's, it's got a, it's got a big subwoofer, which I got next to the, the lounge chair over here and two decently sized, like treble speakers. And it does the trick, man. So, um, you mentioned the cover before and, um, Oh, well, good, I, uh, yeah. yeah it's a good, good headphones too. It's good. It, my stuff also. If you got good pair of headphones, it, it's yeah. really either way. Either way, you just mentioned either on a really good sound system, like we're just talking about, or a really good pair of headphones. Either way is good. I try to get it to where it sounds good on both. It, it, it's it's odd. Sometimes it'll sound good better on one than the other, but it almost always comes out the way I want it on headphones. And on the the system itself, it normally normally works out good on that way too. Yeah, there is just something about headphones where things just tend to sound better on headphones. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, when I'm getting my sounds just right now, I, I use my headphones 99% of the time. So professional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me tell you. The ones I have really aren't that professional, honestly. I saw some people talking about headphones the other day. Like, yeah, I got some good there for the other day for a good price, $400. I was like, what Whoa, the? <laughs> I, I was like, damn, mine are like 70 bucks, and they're killer, I think. <laughs> Sennheiser is what they're called. I mean, they're, they're good. Germans make good stuff. I give them that. The clip speakers I have are German. That's it. They're good at making stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got to have their Wagner and just perfect, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, you talked about the cover, and I noticed your stuff is always very visually rich. Like when I released uh, your first little uh, mini LP, Treating the Sick mm-hmm. Through Sonic Violence, you had you know, four inserts on that sucker and yeah. then in front of the back cover. And then this album not coming out has, if I remember four images, maybe five. Mm, yeah. I actually have made an image for each track. Actually. I, I usually do that. I, I make an image for each track that I record, but uh, I, I picked the ones that I thought would go with the release of the, the best or that I think came out the best a combination of both. And I sent them, to you for the release. So I, okay, I, that was great the way you used a lot on the first one, man. It looks fantastic. Oh, thank you. I I saw all those pictures and I just thought, you know, I got to do this justice. I got to work all these in. And so, yeah, <laughs> you did that. You did that. So, um, uh, what I really wanted to ask you was, um, which comes first? Is it the music and then you find images to match the music, or is it the image and mm-hmm. then you and then based on looking at the image, you're inspired to make music? Right. It happens both ways. Uh, I'll, I'll run across a picture that I like, or I'll search like a topic that I'm interested in, like either war or surgery or mental illness or something like that, and I'll find images that I think either look good or that I can make look better, and I'll save them for the future. And I'll be like, hey, I can use this and on this song. This looks like it would mix with this song. And I do the same thing with song titles. I'll just be sitting around the house doing whatever, and I'll, a song title will pop into my head, so I'll write it down. I've got a couple pages of them worth of track titles written down, and I'll be working on a track, a new track or something. I'll be like, damn, this mix is good with that. This sounds like it would mix, like it would match that, that song. This, this reminds me of this imagery. So I'll put the two together. Or sometimes I'll be making a song, and a title will pop into my head. That happened with Panzer Production Line. I was like, man, this reminds me of like tanks being produced. So I came up with that title right there on the spot. So um, I also noticed that you do a lot of treatment on your uh, on your images too. Like they they almost look kind of like grainy photographs. Like they could have been taken in the 1930s, but they're 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 these horrible, you know, garish looking uh monstrosities so right. <laughs> do you, so do you do, do like digital production like or do you... yeah i usually um at first i would pretty much ju- just use the image as it was that i found and then put a mind of god logo on it but eventually i got into uh manipulating them with software and whatnot and making them look a little better or how i wanted them to look sometimes they look totally different than what the original picture looked So that's um, basically all I, uh, I I wanted to ask you about. So, um, well, obviously, uh, since uh, growing the label is an important thing, uh, what brought you to the Revolution Walker after nap time? Mm, the fact that it, that your job on my initial 
release was everything I expected and more. I was like, man, I see Reed's got something new going on. I was like, let me contact him because that's the way to go. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad uh, you really liked that first release because I really, Absolutely. I really enjoyed uh, putting that out there. Because, Fantastic, man. Because one of the downsides of SP was um, it was like noise, 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 yeah, ambient, I know, I know. and the some sun, noise. Though. The sand, I know, and some of it is good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah, well, no, you no, can no I mean, take yeah. so much of one thing. You yeah, know? I, I mean, I make noise, so it's, I can't right. really complain about noise. It's just it was really nice to see something different. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I could bring that, man, because uh, the, when I'm doing – I feel like it's really underrepresented out there. It seems like there's a lot of, uh, if it's electronically made, it seems like it's either noise or, uh, or a, lot of, a lot of the underground musicians are making like uh, what you call like the depressive black metal or, um, or it's dance music type shit. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of stuff like I'm doing out there. So I, I, I'm glad about that. In, in a way, it, it's hard because people are like, what, what is this? You know, it's like they don't really know it. I think a lot of people really don't know what to make of it. But at the same time, I think that uh, the few, the far between, the worthy understand what's going on. That's really all that matters when it boils down to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was hoping to end this on one of your new tracks. So if you could pick a new track from your album, which would you like to uh, close out this interview with? Oh, hold on. Oh, one from the new one? Yeah. Okay, how about uh, we could go with Twitching Methods. Twitching Methods? Okay, yeah. so um, this is uh, Retro Foreman speaking with uh, Jason A. Pizzolatto. I'm pronouncing it correctly now. <laughs> and <laughs> the man behind Mind of God. And uh, thank you for listening to the Revolution Will Craft for Naptime Artist Spotlight. And this is Mind of God's new track, Twitching Methods. <laughs>